seconds to count. This program is sponsored by San Jacinto College. Your goals, your college. Hi, I'm Cecilia Latriz, and I'm from Chile. I am Adonia Sarevalo, and I am from El Salvador. Hi, I'm Maria Jimeno, and I'm from Spain. My name is Ademir Olguin. I'm from Mexico. I'm Juan Nino, I'm from Bogota, Colombia, and I just wanted to set the record straight. It's not Chile, it's Chile. And yes, we have the best wine. So no, in Spain, we don't sleep for two hours every day. I wanted to set the record straight about the spelling of my country, Colombia. Colombia is spelled with an O and not with a U. But we might take a siesta on the weekends. C-O-L-O-M-B-I-A. And Mexicans not only eat tacos, beans, and rice. Mexican cuisine is actually one of the most renowned cuisines in the world. author and host of the TV series Super Latina. And I'm Osvaldo Corral, host of Univision's Edición Digital Houston. Welcome to Houston Public Media's Town Hall event. Tu voz es poder, your voice is power. As you can see, there is a great diversity of Houston's Latino community. In fact, this town hall is part of Houston Public Media's year-long Diverse City Initiative, which looks at what it really means to be the most diverse metropolitan area in the country. And here's how to go into work tonight. First, as you can hear, we are presenting this program in English, but we are translating everything into Spanish in our secondary audio channel. So. If your TV supports SAP programming, you can switch to Spanish language. We're also streaming live in English and Spanish on HoustonPublicMedia.org and at Univision.com slash Houston. We'll be dividing the show into two halves. In just a moment, I'll be leading a discussion about immigration from a local and national perspective. And I'll follow up with conversations about achieving success with Latino leaders from Houston's business and cultural scenes. Of course, we have a live studio audience who will be taking part in tonight's conversation, but we want you at home to connect with us as well. Aurora Lozada is in our digital studios to tell us how viewers can participate. Hola, Aurora. Gracias, Gaby y Osvaldo. As Gabi said, we want you at home to be an active participant in this program. This is your town hall too. And it's simple. You can tweet your questions or comments to us using the hashtag tu voz es poder or your voice is power. Or you can write comments under our Facebook live feeds. You can do this in English or Spanish. Here in our digital studios, we'll be monitoring our social media feeds on the screen beside me. We will also have experts on hand to answer your questions and we'll be reading your comments throughout the show. So we'll see you again in just a little while. Back to you guys. Muchas gracias, Aurora. Immigration is one of those topics that's inescapable. We often view it through the lens of those who are deported. But of course, it also affects those who are left behind. Yes, and this next story is very powerful illustration of what life is like when a national policy de decision Kids close to home. Everyone goes through something in life. This is something that I'm going through. I don't like the fact that people judge me. I don't like the fact that people are pointing fingers and calling Jose a bad hombre for illegal. He's a good man, a good provider, who really just misses his wife and kids. My name is Rosemary Asensio Escobar. I am married to Jose Escobar, and together we have two lovely children. Walter Escobar, who is seven, Carmen Escobar, who is two. Jose was recently deported in March 2017. Jose was deported because he had an order of deportation that was set back in 2006. It was a misfiled paperwork. This year when we went in, everything was okay, uh, but they, instead of just signing our paper, they started asking us questions like, where do you live? Whose house is it? Do you drink and drive? Are you a criminal? After they detained Jose at our routine check-in, my phone rang and I 
turned it on and I said, hi, Jose. He goes, okay, honey, look, I'm gonna give you information, but I need you to don't cry, don't get scared. And I said, you're scaring me. He goes, Rosie deported me last night. I'm a US citizen. If our president is saying that he's taking care of the American people, what about me? Financially, it's hard. The other part that hurts me the most is the hate that we've been getting. Jose is a good man, and for him not to be here now, it hurts because a lot of people are thinking, well, Trump said he'll deport criminals. Your husband must be a criminal. He did something to, to deserve what he's going through. The way we see Jose now is literally each kid has a messenger in their tablet, so whenever Jose wants to call them, he calls them, or whenever they want to speak to daddy, he's right there in a button. I love my husband and he loves us very much. All Jose wants, he wants to come back home. All we want is a pathway. Rosa Escobar's story is frightening because many of us may know families in similar situations. And incidents like this could increase because of one local law, Senate Bill 4 or SB 4. And actually, tonight we have here in the audience, Rose. Hello, Rose. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. <clears throat> to talk about how this law might affect our community, please welcome our first panel. We have Chief Art Acevedo. He's the first Hispanic to lead the Houston Police Department. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, Chief Acevedo. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We also have Julio Torres. He's with the Harris County Republican Party. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Andrea Gutin is the legal director of the Houston Immigration Legal Services Collaborative. Thanks for having me. Did I say it right? You did. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect. <laughs> uh, this is my accent, and it's not going to change in the next 90 minutes. So you need to bear with me, please. <laughs> and we also have Carlos Duarte uh, with the Texas State Director of Mi Familia Vota, a group focused on voters' engagement in the Latino community. And for those of you who are engaging with us on social media, we have an immigration attorney also in our digital studio ready to answer your questions. So please pose those questions now. We're going to start. Mr. Acevedo, we have about six weeks to, to have SB4 in uh, our community. How are you preparing for this? Well, we are developing a very uh, specific policy on how our officers are going to uh, work to uh, embrace the, this policy in terms of not violating the law, but most importantly reminding them that we are not going to tolerate racial profiling, that the law doesn't uh, allow them to have uh, racial profiling, and most importantly also making sure they understand people's rights because people, if we start asking people about their uh, status, mm -hmm. you're not required to answer it. So my job is to prepare them to make sure that they're not violating the Constitution of the United States and to make sure I protect them by making sure they're well-trained, well-versed on the law and our expectations, which is a zero tolerance for racial profiling. Andrea, um, you are an attorney and also uh, you work with Houston Immigration Legal Services. So how are you preparing also for this? Um, the attorneys in all of our nonprofits, because the collaborative is made up of most of the legal services providers here in Houston, we're going out into the community, giving Know Your Rights presentations, making sure, like the chief said, people know that they don't have to answer questions about their status. In fact, they don't have to talk to enforcement agents at all if they don't wish to, unless they're being arrested or detained. Um, we're also trying to do family preparedness clinics so that people who fear that they may be deported can make sure that their children who live in the United States can be safe and cared for in case that they are deported. And as always, we're continuing to provide people with immigration legal services. I'm pretty sure that you have seen many cases like uh, Rose Escobar. So how those kind of uh, cases have increased in your office? Yeah, I mean, the providers that the collaborative works with have seen um, a lot of stories about people just afraid to access services. Um, so a lot of times, even when we do Know Your Rights presentations, people are afraid to come to them unless we're going out to their communities because they're afraid to leave the places that they know that are safe. So we're getting reports that people aren't accessing public benefits, aren't accessing health. Um, and so that's also very worrying for people's safety. You know, the population in Houston is nearly 25% foreign born. We're hugely mm -hmm. diverse. Like We're the face of what the United States is going to be 
in the future. And so what we do here is kind of a testing ground, and we should be a positive testing ground, not a negative one. Exactly. Mr. Carlos Duarte with Mi Familia Vota. How is your organization preparing for what's going to happen in, in the next six weeks? Well, I would say that it's not only my organization, but it's actually a collaborative of number of organizations that are working with the community. <clears throat> and the community itself, it's not taking this law as a given. We are challenging it with our partners, uh, you know, through, through the courts. But we are also preparing to put a fight and mobilize our community. Uh, we are determined to actually educate the community on what are the legislators that actually voted to pass this law. Because 2018 is just around the corner. And people will have an opportunity to, you know, basically express how they feel about this law at the ballot box. So the community is organizing, you know, registering people to vote, uh, getting ready to go out, and also mm -hmm. talking to legislators. We have an opportunity, obviously, right now at the state legislature. Exactly. Uh, a bill has been introduced to repeal uh, SB4. Uh, I do not think that it's going to be uh, hurt, even hurt, uh, but the community is going to be there pushing for it to be repealed. Yes, in the last few weeks, we have seen a lot of different events. Uh of the community trying to repeal this law. We even got a group of quinceañeras mm -hmm. walking down the aisles dressed like quinceañeras and, and trying to, to uh, avoid this, this law to be implemented. Now, um, Mr. Julio Torres, you're with the Harris County Republican Party. Yes, uh, obviously, the Republican Party supports SB4. Uh, well, let me just start with, uh, with this. Uh, the Republican Party has always been the party which, for the most part, promotes the, the, the respect for the rule of law and promotes also uh, the understanding of the law. We, we, we educate people uh, of the facts of the law. Uh, with that being said, we uh, believe that this law uh, was created and crafted from start to finish to actually help the law enforcement officers to protect the good citizens of Texas from the people mm -hmm. who are here illegally committing crimes. Well, m many people will say that uh, there may have be a better way to make a law uh, against uh, legal immigration without affecting families like roses. Right. Well, we don't, we don't have any uh, uh, influence on, on what the law is. We're just a party and, and, and we uh, support the legislator, uh, legislator's effort to, to craft a way to where the law enforcement officers are going to be helped uh, by pushing the law to the to the extent where uh, the, the citizens of Texas are going to be protected. You That's mainly to, the I'm sword. sorry to interrupt, yeah. but, I, but I have to take exception with that. Oh, yeah. Law enforcement was very loud and very clear in our right. opposition to SB4. Mm -hmm. We were very loud and we were very clear in our opposition to the Schaefer Amendment, which is nothing more than political theater. Mm -hmm. This, with all due respect to you, and I know that you're not the legislator, this law is hurting public safety. We're already going after the crooks in this state. We exactly. didn't need them. When labor, when police labor agrees with police management, we can't even agree on the time of day sometimes. That's a clue that it's a very bad policy. You've set up our, not you, but our mm -hmm. legislature has, and our governor and our mm -hmm. lieutenant governor has set up our state for failure. They've made us less safe. Our economic vibrancy is at risk. And this is a matter when we have these bad policies that impacts it impacts public safety, national security, and the economic future of Texas. Yes. The impacts is already being felt. People aren't mm -hmm. reporting crimes. Uh, we can't get people to work. Uh, other uh, companies are speaking out against it. Fortune 500 companies are speaking out against it. Mm -hmm. So who they're representing, it's not law enforcement, it's not business, and it's certainly not public safety. How do you say to that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> what, what, uh, what we understand, uh, the way the law was crafted, um, we, uh, the way we see it, our perspective is that uh, people who are afraid of reporting a crime mm -hmm. or calling the police uh, uh, departments for anything, uh, uh, they should not be afraid of it. They, they should not fear uh, the police. I mean, the, the law itself uh, mm -hmm. bans or prohibits uh, law enforcement officers from inquiring into their uh, legal status if they are a witness to a crime, a victim of a crime, or exactly. a person reporting a crime. Well, however, unless you yeah, become a suspect. Yeah, however, I've heard this, and uh, um, please, uh, Chief Acevedo, let me know if I'm wrong. But I've heard that, let's say, a police officer stopped an undocumented immigrant, okay, and he checks on his background record, and if he has a detention order from immigration, he's already committing a crime and it may be arrested. Is that true or not? 
we don't arrest people based on a civil detainer. We do not arrest people. We are a criminal justice agency that are focused on penal code violations, that are focused on violent crime, on property crime. If they're arrested for a penal violation, uh, criminal code mm -hmm. violation, later on, if there's an ICE detainer, that's a separate issue. But the, the Houston Police Department, you know, as, as our model I've kind of created is we, we chase crooks, not cooks. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make T-shirts that say that, remind people. We, uh, it's really important for people to realize that most police officers get it. They became police officers to make the community safe mm -hmm. and not to go after people that but for their immigration status are actually here making life better for all of us. Exactly. And actually, uh, I'm going to ask the next question to Andrea because you're the only lady in this table. <laughs> and um, actually, uh, the Harris County attorney, Vince Ryan, he said that SB4 goes against his job, which is protect uh, Texans' families. Uh, domestic violence uh, is, it has pretty considerable numbers in the Latino community. So I'm pretty sure that a lot of women, they're not going to report this domestic violence that affects their families. Yeah, and I mean, the chief has already cited um, reporting statistics that have decreased. Um, this has been because of the national immigration, anti-immigrant climate, and then when it becomes localized, it even worsens. So correct me on these numbers if I'm wrong, but reporting of rape in the Latino community was down 42%. 42.8% throughout the first quarter of 2017 versus 2016. Wow. But the shocking part is that it's up for the rest of society. So again, chilling effect on reporting. Uh, is not good for any of us. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, yes, that, that, is, that is a fact. But, but again, uh, we believe that that's because of the misinformation out there. People, again, are, are, are not going to be questioned on their legal status when they're a victim uh, to, uh, of a crime, a witness to a crime. We're and, also yeah. assuming and also, that uh, officers uh, know uh, that officers too, right? Always, or that officers know the difference between someone who has status or who doesn't. There are many different statuses that exist right. in immigration law, right? It's not just undocumented and exactly. citizen. There are a variety of different visas. Like somebody could be eligible for something and just hasn't had the opportunity to see an attorney because seeing an attorney isn't free, right? Uh, Osvaldo, if, um, yeah. if I may, I, I, I believe that Texas has really become ground zero for immigration fight. Mm -hmm. The governor and the legislature knew very well what was going to happen. It, you know, both at the Senate hearing committees and, and the House committees, there was law enforcement, it was the religious community, it was the attorneys showing the evidence that we've had from other states that have passed similar laws. Yeah, like SB, Arizona. SB 1070 in Arizona, exactly. it's, a, it's a case. In, and it's not only the impact that it has had on families, but most importantly, I would say that it goes against what we are as Texans because it promotes racial profiling, even though the law says that it is illegal. The experience in other states has shown that we, what, what the, it ends up being, it's a permit to have beach, uh, batch vigilantes. So the reality is that all of the statistics show that this was a terrible law. It was proven time after mm -hmm. time in testimony, and the legislature still, choose, still chose mm -hmm. to pass this, this law. And, so and it, in Arizona, I mean, there were constitutional challenges, just like there are constitutional challenges now, right? So the law will go into September 1st unless the courts stop it. And the law, as written in Arizona, was challenged wasn't implemented fully because it did, you know, violate constitutional rights. And I think the racial profiling is a huge issue. And I mean, it has a huge impact, and it has a huge impact actually on tourism. We, we saw in, in other states did, yeah. that when people are traveling to the state to do business and they yeah. are racially profiled, guess what? We get stained. And the yeah. worst thing that is going to happen is that Texas is being labeled as an anti-immigrant, as a not welcoming state. And that Mr. is not Mr. who Mr. we are. Yeah. Mr. Torres, For what no would be the similarities or differences between SB4 and Arizona's uh, 1070? Oh, they're, they're different. Completely different. Uh, what again, are the main differences? Again, uh, uh, it was legal, according to the law in Arizona, to ask uh, uh, legal statuses mm -hmm. of, of people or detainees based on their uh, looks, based on, based on their color of skin if it was probable cause for the officer to ask. Now in Texas, that's, that's prohibited uh, by, the, by the Constitution of Texas and by the Constitution of the yeah. U.S. But you just now, made a statement that we have been in policing. Right. And here's what's really frustrating. The, law, the American police officer's job is to safeguard mm -hmm. uh, our communities. Mm -hmm. We have experienced historical low crime in our countries. Yeah. This city used to get up to a thousand murders a year. Right now, uh, murders are down. Uh, look at what's happening in New York, every big city. How did we do that? Community policing. Community policing, building bridges of trust. This mm -hmm. law actually puts us back 
30 years. And, I, and, I'm, and, I, and, I, and, I, and again, I take exception because it's the hypocrisy. If you're really interested in illegal immigration, go after the employers. Shut down a business if you catch them with one illegal immigrant. I challenge the legislature to pass those laws. Why won't they do it? Because they know it will destroy our economy. So let's keep cops focused on what matters most is public safety, and let's stop with the political theater that's hoping no, that's help. And, no. I, and I feel sorry for you because you're trying to carry the water for for the governor, the lieutenant governor. They should be on this show right. and not having a surrogate no. here answering to law enforcement. No, 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 yes, now I have a question that I'm, I'm pretty sure that people who is against and forces before will be concerned. Where is Texas going to get the money? to pay the police officers to implement this law? Because it's going to cost you some money. How, how much it will cost oh, you? No, hey, not only are they not going to give us the money, not only are they not going to give us the money, they're not going to defend us. And quite frankly, today or yesterday, DPS says they're going to start charging the, ci the cities to use their lab. And now the state wants us to do the federal government's work. 75% of my fleet is over, uh, is over miles. We're about 2,000 officers short. Thank God we have a mayor in Sylvester Turner and a council that gets it and a community that gets it and that we're going to stand against this law because at the end of the day, we're focusing the city of Houston not on primary politics. We're focusing on what's good for people as a community of faith mm -hmm. and as a safety community and I think as elected officials. And I'm, I'm blessed so, to be here in this Mr. Torre, go ahead. One thing, again, and, and with all the respect to, to Chief Acevedo, we believe that the, 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 the as before uh, bill was created in good faith to help you uh, detain people who can harm the, the citizens of Texas. People who are here legally, they should not be here harming people. That, that's that's, clear. that's exactly. the problem. You're trying to sell it as a public safety. You cannot sell something as a public safety bill when law enforcement, when myself, the police chief in Dallas, the police chief in uh, San Antonio, the police chief Austin. in Austin, all the police chiefs, Sorry. sheriffs are saying, don't do it. Right. So it doesn't add up. That's like, you know, what happened in, uh, during the Gulf War. Uh, first Gulf War, uh, the politicians uh, in, in George Bush Sr. listened to the generals who wanted to carry out his, what's your political objective? If your political objective is public safety, then you need to listen to your subject matter experts. And in this case, we were ignored, which is what happened during the second Gulf War. We know how that worked we out. Ha we have a few minutes to, to finish this segment, so I would like to ask you only one minute. So final thought. Chief. Final thought is for the community that's in fear, know this. I know the collective hired police officers. Will there be some outliers out there that will use this as an excuse for racial profiling? Yes. It's important that you complain because you can't make decisions just based on the color of somebody's skin. You're not required to be white. You're not required to speak English. And you're not required to not have an accent to prove yourself to be here in this country legally. Please report crime. Please don't let fear yeah. dictate you. And more importantly, let us know when we're racially okay. profiling. Really, really okay. quick, Andrea. Yeah, and so I think that families need to see an attorney, figure out what their immigration options are. I think that they need to be reporting when there are instances of racial pro profiling. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just inside of the city of Houston, but greater city Houston. And there's a phone number that Hillsk runs together with other nonprofits, which is 1-888-507-2970. You can call Mr. for Torres, your rights information. Thought? Really well, quick, really quick. Real quick, this is not uh, for people who believe this is a racial law. It is not a racial law. Uh, please don't be afraid to report any crimes. If you're a witness or if, just to make a phone call to police officers, don't be afraid of doing it. Because again, Walker? it is illegal and it will be still legal under the my law. Co my call is to law enforcement. I commend Chief Acevedo. They need to be meeting in all of these different cities with community uh, because there are certain policies that can be implemented at the local level that will help us protect our community. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. Let's go back now to Aurora Lozada in our digital studios. Aurora, what are the viewers saying about as before? Gracias, Osvaldo. The debate here is as hot as it is out there. We have a couple of comments from people chiming in about the SB4 and the whole immigration issue. One of them is telling us there were raids reported in Austin. Are there raids going on in H-Town? If so, what's specifically happening with the kids? Other people are telling us, like one of words, the fear in the Latino community since SB4 in Texas is real. It can be denied away. And here with us to answer some of the questions that we got tonight is immigration lawyer Carolina ortuz Diaz. Thank you very much for being with us tonight. Sure, my pleasure. Carolina, we have a couple of questions coming in. One of them is, how do you identify someone whose legal status is in question? Yes, uh, one of the recommendations is you really need to have your uh, ID, uh, passport uh, from your home country valid. You need to have one ID. Uh, 
a passport will be great, right? But that's the main question. As before, that's not going to be providing any training to uh, police officers to comp understand, you know, are you in a tourist visa? Are you in an, as an investor? Are you adjusting the status in the process of becoming a permanent resident? How do you explain that with maybe a brief, no? A legal right. document that is going to go one step at a time. That's one of the big questions for the law. Other people are also concerned about their own status now that is before is coming up. And we have Barbie Gonzalez asking that um, she came legally to visit her fiance, they got married, they have a baby, and now she's concerned and she wants to know how soon or how fast she can get legal status. Very good. This is the time for uh, someone like Barbie, you know, to start looking into how to um, legalize her status. And this actually is a, it's a process that is, is very, um, one of the fastest process. If she came legally, she's married to a U.S. citizen or they have a family, they have evidence of a good faith marriage, they can af apply for, for immigration status and she can become a permanent resident in about eight to nine months. Okay, and finally, someone here is asking us, I would like to find out about the Texan law as before that involves policemen requesting papers from people. In very general terms, as before is a law in Texas that is going to enter into effect September 1st. We have four lawsuits pending against this law. We need to pay attention. One of the big uh, cases is in San Antonio and we're expecting some kind of decision in August. But this law does a couple of things. It's going to allow the police officers to ask questions about immigration and you have a right to say, officer, I have a right to remain silent, right? Then the other thing it does is it mandates the police officers, officers in general, to comply with something called detainers. It's, a, it's an order from immigration officers to keep someone on hold while they are detained and while they pick them up. So that's one of the questions that are very challenging in this case. Okay, Carolina, we also have someone with the following question. Everyone thinks immigration issue is so black and white. But think for a sec, if it were your mom, would deportation be okay? Would you, would you say to people who are fearing as before that they have to fear deportation necessarily? Is this something that if it gets into effect starting September 1st can actually be dealt with? Yes, actually uh, you have to be very careful because you cannot look into state law without thinking about what the new administration is doing. And under the new executive actions of President Trump, anybody who, is, who doesn't have any immigration status could be facing deportation. Now, if we have family ties, if we have children that are U.S. citizen, and we have residing relatives for more than 10 years, we don't have any criminal records, we have a strong case to fight an immigration court in immigration under the current law. So it's very important you see an attorney and you understand your uh, rights and your uh, ability to probably uh, legalize your status. Okay, and, and to that point, a lot of the people who are sending comments and questions to us are basically fearing that they don't know exactly how to handle this situation. At what point do you think that they need to go and visit an attorney? Right away. Every case is different. And, and sometimes it takes a long time to just to understand and to collect the documentation that is going to allow you to find that uh, maybe petition uh, that your family member filed for you or your, or your mother, or basically to start a process the processes with immigration take a little bit longer than you want so it's better sooner than later to understand the real aspect of your case finally very quickly carolina we have a question and it says i literally yo tengo dos niños y no tengo familia i have two children and i have no family here ¿Qué pasa si con mis hijos, si ICE me detiene? what's going to happen with my children if eyes arrests me uh, it's uh, so sad i mean i it's just um it is hard <laughs> That mother has to have a plan B, we call it, right? A family member, a neighbor, and a power of attorney that can give that other person that she trusts some kind of power to pick up the kids from school, to take them to the, to, uh, the doctor. Uh, a plan B is super important. Okay, thank you very much, Carolina, for your answers. And remember, the hashtags are Tu Voz Es Poder, Your Voice Is Power. We're waiting for your questions and for your comments. Back to you, Osvaldo. Gracias, Aurora. Gracias, Carolina. And please, guys at home, remember to send your questions, okay? They are very important to us. When it comes to national immigration issues, I'm pretty sure you have heard a lot about two words, DACA and DAPA. Joining me now to explain those terms and what's happening nationally and how they can affect locally, we have Ali Nurani. 
right here in this camera. You are the executive director of the National Immigration Forum. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. We also have Cassie Luevano with the Republican Party of Texas. Thank you for coming, Cassie. Of course, glad to be here. Also, somebody who's very well known here in Houston, Texas, especially if you watch local newscasts, Cesar Espinosa, found, founder of the organization Immigrant Families and Students in the Struggle, also known as FIEL. Thank you for having me, gracias. Thank you very much. And we also have Vladimir Davidiuk, did I say it right? You did. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. You are uh, the Har with also with the Republic, uh, Harris County Republican Party. I am. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for joining us, Guy. Well, if somebody at home is not familiar with those uh, acronyms DACA and DAPA, I'm going to ask uh, Cesar, what do they mean? Uh, DACA stands for the the the, the, the Defense of Childhood Arrivals for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program, which was established as an executive order that was announced by President Obama after 10 years of long struggle by the Dreamer movement, more than 10 years. Um, so it's something that didn't just come about and, and materialize out of clean air. It, it is a movement that built up uh, fighting for the DREAM Act, which ended up being the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals Program. Fortunately, right now our community is under attack. We as Dreamers are under attack, uh, but we're gonna continue to fight uh, not only for our futures, but for the more than 11 million undocumented people who currently reside and live within the United States. But uh, President Trump, he said that people with DACA is fine. They have said, but unfortunately, because of political reasons, Ken Paxton, uh, who is the real criminal, who is being indicted for uh, committing crimes, uh, is decided to use uh, Dreamers as a political ploy to get attention away from him. So uh, we will be watching, and we know what, what mm -hmm. this really means. And in reality, the life of 800,000 undocumented immigrants are in their hands right now. So we ask that uh, dreamers come out of the shadows, they mm -hmm. continue to fight, and they continue to fight for justice. Now, uh, Vladimir, uh, uh, Texas General Attorney uh, Ken Paxton, uh, he said that he's not okay uh, with DACA and he wants to eliminate it. Do you agree with him and why? I do agree with him, and it, it, makes, it makes good policy sense. DACA and DAPA were both implemented by President Obama using an executive order, um, and that's a reflection on his failed leadership uh, when he became president. Um, he became president in 2009. He had two years of a Congress controlled, dominated by Democrats, and the White House. He could have passed any agenda he wanted. He had the ability to push through immigration reform. In fact, for years, before, what, before he became president, when he was campaigning, he promised the Hispanic community that he would resolve their immigration crisis, mm -hmm. that he would resolve the problems that Americans have, America's having with immigration reform and implement comprehensive program. He failed to do so. So what did that leave him? He had a yeah. pen and he had a phone. He decided to implement DACA and DAPA, which are policies that on their face are admirable. And it's understandable that those, those, we would want those people who came here through no fault of their own uh -huh. and are productive members of society, we'd want to try to find a way to remedy that. But, but, uh, but, but implementing it through an executive order was exactly the wrong policy. Well, but does make it a wrong policy just being implemented by an executive order? It doesn't have the force of law. That's the problem. It needed Congress to pass a law, and it needed the signature of a president to make it full authority and constitutionally compliant. The fact that President Obama decided to use his pen and use his phone to pass DACA and pass DAPA because he had squandered his opportunity mm -hmm. to use the, the legislative process is a reflection on his, on his failed leadership and his failure to follow through on his promises to the Hispanic yeah. community but, who's present here. Well, now, uh, here's the problem with that. Uh -huh. We have an opportunity to remedy those things, but we're, we need both sides to work together to find a comprehensive solution. Exactly. And right now, we don't have both sides but, working. We have one side working against finding a solution, mm -hmm. and it's the Democrats who are doing it. Well, we let me, let me ask Cassie Ka Ka this. Okay, when <laughs> President Obama tr tried to, to help the immigrant community, uh, the Congress was, and, and still is, the majority is a Republican, so mm -hmm. he never found the support. So, Well, you know, and that's exactly the point. You know, like he said, you can't pick up a, a pen and your phone to do it. You know, we got to work together. And, he, and as the leader mm -hmm. of this country, I think he was responsible to connect with Congress and make sure that we implement the rules that he's obligated to do. He's a leader and he needs to lead by example, which he failed to do. And as Republicans, we stand with our leadership mm -hmm. from the governor to the attorney general and the lieutenant governor. We absolutely stand and we support them 100% as the Republican Party of Texas. But the, Repu the Republican Party didn't offer any other alternative. 
Well, you see, and before we can have those conversations, this leads into why we need to reform our immigration system. Mm -hmm. This is exactly our point that we're trying to make. We in Texas, we in America, we can champion, champion all these efforts. We, we are a nation that is viewed by the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we have the American dream, but we must follow these policies and we must work together as a country, Congress and the president. We must lock arms and listen to our leadership. Ali, uh, well, we're we talking that uh, President Obama may, may not be the right way, the, the DACA and DAPA. But do you think that maybe was a first good step for an immigration reform? You know, I got to be honest with you. With you. I, you know, we can relitigate the past. We can debate kind of who said what, who did what. But right now we are faced with a Trump administration, a Republican Senate, a Republican House. There is a tremendous opportunity for Republicans to seize this moment and actually advance the interests of the American worker and their families mm -hmm. by passing different immigration reforms. What worries us is that the administration so far has moved forward with executive orders that ramp up enforcement dramatically, that ban, that seek to ban Muslims and refugees fleeing violence, that, and we've seen the House Republicans only move legislation that increases enforcement. In fact, there are Republicans in Senate that want to slash legal immigration by 50%. Republicans are missing a tremendous opportunity. In fact, yet the only person, one of the only people in the United States Congress right now leaning into this from, from a Republican perspective is Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. Yesterday, he teamed up with Dick Durbin to introduce the DREAM Act. That's what we need, but it re requires Republicans to look beyond an enforcement-only approach. And right now, that's where the majority of them are stuck. Do you agree that the Republican Party is missing a chance right now? I, I, I don't think that we're missing a chance. I think we're, we're, we're having an opportunity where we could lead if we had an, an opposition party that was willing to use this as a chance to implement yeah, real immigration the, the reform and not just as a political talking point. During, during the, the problem that we face now no. is that the, the opposition, no. Democrats, are consistently interested only in using immigration reform as a way to bash Republicans, as a talking point to further their own agenda, and as a fundraising mechanism. They've implemented nothing, they've offered nothing that offers a long-term solution so to actually move forward. You want to say something about yeah, that, right? No, so the definitely. funny, the funny part about this is that uh, when the Democrats are in, the power, are in power, Republicans say Democrats should move forward. When Republicans are in power, they say it's Democrats exactly. should move forward. So, so basically it's politics, right? <laughs> right. So, I mean, so, I think, I think what we have to do here is realize that, and I wrote a book about this, it's called There Goes the Neighborhood, and what I found is that the majority of Americans, they do not see this issue as one of politics and policy. They see this issue as culture and values, and they want to live, yes, in a country that is safe, but they want to live in a country that is welcoming, and that's the opportunity that Republicans have. Now, uh, sister, let me ask you this, uh, is, are people who can enroll on DACA, are they afraid of enrolling now? Uh, there's a huge fear in, enrol in the enrollment of DACA um, because coming out of the shadows, I mean, is, is kind of a big deal. I mean, we, uh, we're people who were born here, well, not born here, who have studied here, who have lived our entire lives here, and to all of a sudden give up the information to the federal government who apparently doesn't seem to want us here, even though they use our community, even though they profit from our community, then that's a big deal. And to your point, it's been the same message for over a decade that that you want enforcement and your party wants to use our community and in many instances take advantage of our community but at the same time you don't want to and that's modern day slavery and the same thing to to reinstate your point it's 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 the same thing when president obama was in office you said he doesn't want to work with the republican party he doesn't want to do this but your party didn't want to work with him either and now you're saying that oh, okay well we have but now the democrats don't want to work so you can't play with our lives. We are human beings and we deserve the right to live under the Constitution with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Cassie, and that's what we deserve. Yeah. You want to say something about that, right? Absolutely. Cassie. On that note, on that note, you know, coming under, be, you know, being Americans and following the rule of law and the Constitution, I'm an you know, what, not saying that you're not. I'm, let me head to a conversation yeah. that I'm about to have. One thing that our country is struggling with, our state is struggling with, is doing this something exactly like this. And I'm happy to be here today. These conversations with leaders from both sides, they need to happen more often. And it doesn't need to be mm -hmm. from one side of the street to the other. Exactly. We need leaders from both sides to come together. And you know what? We have to thank God that we can do that in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, because in a lot of other areas, 
it doesn't happen that way. We can't have a police chief. We can't have an attorney. We can't have the activist. We're in America. Mm -hmm. We got to turn the new leaf. We have to respect the leadership that we have. Like I said, it's important. And I know that in these communities, I come from a community. I come from a background of the Rio Grande Valley, South Texas, one of the most, you know, Brownsville, which is an hour south of where I was born, one of the poorest areas in the country. Mm -hmm. And I know that we have these leaders, but we must follow the legal process in order to ensure that we keep championizing America. That's the president's message to make America great again. Yeah. Vladimir, let me, let me ask you this. Do you think that DACA has affected in a negative way our society or the country? Well, the question isn't whether or not DACA has negatively affected our country. The question is, and to respond to something that Cesar said, um, the people who came here under that, under that umbrella, DACA and DAPA, came here, as he said, because they, they had the dream of the American dream. They wanted to come to a country where they had the, the opportunity to experience life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The thing is that the dream, the American dream, and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are all based on the foundation of the American principle, which is based on the rule of law. Mm -hmm. Without the rule of law, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is non-existent. Without life, without the law, the concept of the American dream is non-existent. If we refuse to adhere to the concept of law, if we refuse to recognize ourselves as, yes, sure, we're a nation of immigrants, but before we were a nation of immigrants, we were a nation of laws. And if we refuse to recognize the fact that we are a nation of laws, the fact that whoever wants to come here is irrelevant. What, na what makes America great, what makes the the, the opportunity mm -hmm. for immigrants to come here great is that the nation is based on laws and that gives us the opportunity to create a society that so, uh, let, allows let, the life, liberty, and let, the pursuit let, of happiness. Let, let me ask you this. So what solution do we have for people who is running away from uh, uh, gangs, uh, uh, poverty from There's Mexico, South America? There's processes for all of those things. There, there, there are There's rules and laws put in place. What, what, what's that process? process. Because well, number one, you know, we want the most safe and the humanitarian thing to happen. Just, just in our state alone, you know, you, we could look at this at a bigger scale, from the Canada border to the California, Florida, the coastal border. Mm -hmm. But in Texas alone, we live it every day. Whether it's the Texas heat, okay, from sheriffs, from law enforcement to West Texas, to Southwest Texas, to the Rio Grande Valley. Those willing to come to America to prosper. We do not want their lives in danger. And that is one of our strongest voices that that we're trying to push across here. The, it's a so tragic, it's a one tragic one event. Ali, Ali, I want to give the word to Ali. So in Central America, we've seen the, the countries in the Northern Triangle decimated by gang violence. Unfortunately, our refugee laws, both at the national level and the international level, do not recognize gang violence as a government uh, uh, motivated violence that somebody can legally flee. Therefore, mothers make very, very difficult decisions to pay a cartel to smuggle their child to safety in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Now, this administration, instead of focusing on the criminal element in the Northern Triangle, they want to go after the mothers who are trying to bring their children to safety. Exactly. That is a... I mean, now they're an accomplice, right? Right. And, and so, I mean, I, when you ask the question about DACA, DACA was very important for 750,000 young people. I would argue that DACA was actually more important for millions and millions and millions of Americans who realize that their child's best friend is undocumented. The family one pew over at church is undocumented. The family down the street is undocumented. So regardless of what this attorney general does, what the president does, those millions of Americans, they cannot unremember that. We have about two minutes to end up this segment, so final thoughts. Final thoughts, I, I mean, a lot of these people came to the United States to escape to escape dangers to their lives. They came to escape La Mordida or Plata o Plomo. They came here because they knew America is based on laws, America is based on security, and that's where they can achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That was what they came here for. Sir? Um, it's important to point out that we must remember history, and we must remember that it's very convenient for a country to sometimes remember only laws that, that they feel convenient at the time. Slavery was a law at the time, and it wasn't just, and our immigration system is not just at the time. So it's important that we fight back, that we continue to organize, and that our community stands up for its humanity, and we will be doing that. And gracias a las mamás que son tan poderosas, y a los niños que son también tan poderosos por luchar y por estar aquí. Casey? Um, I'm gonna remain that 
we just don't have a broken immigration system. We've had a broken immigration system. And it is time that we fix it, and we fix it the absolutely correct way. We want Texas to prosper, and we want immigrants to come over legally and enjoy the process to enjoy those freedoms and safeties for not just their families, but the communities they choose to live in. Thank you. I would say a big thank you to Houston. I've spent a lot of time in Houston recently, and I've come to really learn so much from Houston as the most diverse city in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the country realizes the vibrancy here and the fact that the city of Houston can encourage the congressional delegation and Senators Cruz and Cornyn to support the DREAM Act. Yeah, because to be honest, Houston uh, is not only, the immigration community is not only the Latinos. These exactly. people from all around the yeah. world, in fact, more than 126 languages are spoken in our area. We have covered a lot in this discussion, so now let's check with Aurora to see how the folks at home are responding. Muchas gracias, Osvaldo. Here at our digital studio, people keep chiming in about immigration and DACA and DAPA particularly. We have someone like Texas leftist telling us to clarify no one has come under DAPA. Trump threw it out because family protections were not important to him. Others, like an American Latino, is saying, um, kind of reflecting the confusion in the community. As an American Latino, do I have to carry my passport at all times? He is an American, so he shouldn't be concerned about that. But here with us again is immigration lawyer Carolina Ortuzar Diaz to answer some of those questions. Carolina, thank you again. Uh, Joycelyn Uribe is asking us the following. I came to the U.S. when I was eight years old. I now have four children. One of them has special needs. What are my guarantees that even if I have DACA, I won't be deported? Right. No guarantees because DACA is not a law. DACA is only an executive action that could change at any moment, at any time, if the new administration decides to cancel DACA. It's just, uh, it's not passed through Congress, so that's, that's a really important thing that to keep in mind. So now, is there a chance that um, with that information, you know, being here, uh, with being the mother of four children, uh, where's the likelihood that she's going to be deported? She probably has a chance, you know, to fight her case in court, to fight that um, deportation, to legalize her, her status. It's not that easy, but under DACA, there's no guarantees. Okay, Angelica Salazar is asking us, what's going to happen with DACA under Trump's presidency? Well, there is a question, right? Because during the uh, campaign, the Trump administration, or President Trump now said that he was going to get rid of DACA. He uh, took power and he decided that he was not going to stop or cancel yeah, DACA. We are facing uh, potential challenges in court uh, and we have been uh, told by Kelly, the Department of Homeland Security uh, Secretary, that he was not going to be defending DACA. So we are, we are in serious trouble, I, I feel. This is not a for sure thing. And along those lines, Luceli Lopez is asking, could you tell more about the bridge that is being discussed to replace DACA? Right. That would be a law. This is a, uh, um, a bill in Congress that will allow DACA recipients, so the, the young children, you know, the young people who is already um, a DACA recipient who has a work permit, to allow them to basically do a little transfer, like transition into something else. So we actually just heard about a new bill that it was uh, submitted in, in, in Congress. It's an initiative that will actually legalize uh, people with DACA. So we see some positive um, uh, you know, news from Congress. Okay, Carolina, here we have someone asking specifically for you, is SB4 linked to DACA? Well, no, because DACA is an executive action coming from the federal government. As before, it's a state law that uh, is going to create um, more difficulties, in my view, right, to people that uh, doesn't have a driving license, uh, that is going to encounter the police, and that may result basically in an arrest and a transfer with ICE. So, but they're not linked, but they are connected because at the end of the day, if you have DACA, you have a, a, a work permit. And with a work permit in Texas, you have a right to request a driver license. If you have a driver license, under SC4, the police officer may not inquire into your immigration status. Okay, and very quickly and finally, Libre USA is asking, what is the likelihood that those immigrants picked up end up in a prison and how long are they generally held? Ooh, uh, people detain. Um, are priority for deportation. Let's put it that way first. 
um, there's a high likelihood that if you have an encounter with the police and you don't have an immigration status at this point, uh, you're going to be transferred with immigration, even if it's just a traffic violation, high likelihood. And uh, we're seeing people detained uh, for minor traffic violations between two to three weeks before they can ask for, for a bond before an immigration judge. Okay, thank you very much, Carolina. And remember, please keep sending your comments and questions for our experts here at our digital studio with the hashtags to both es poder or your voice is power. Back to you, Osvaldo and Gabby. Immigration is one topic that ties many of us together, but with the diversity of Houston's Latino community, there's another bond that connects us, that of achieving the American dream. And here we have one local story of success grabbed in a delicious chocolate coating. <laughs> the diversity in Houston is one of the things that we love the most. My name is Stefano Zulian. I'm one of the owners of Araya Artisan Chocolate. I come from Venezuela. My wife and I decided to leave Venezuela about seven years ago. Basically, we were tired of the whole social and political situation there. The visa process, is, it's, it's difficult. It's not something easy to get. Um, we have an investment visa, which allows us to be here for a five-year term, and then it's renewable. Chocolate is a very big passion for my wife and I. We come from a country that produces one of the best cocoa in the world. And if we had to do something for ourselves, we definitely had to choose something that we felt passion for. And chocolate, cooking, serving people, all aligned with our interests. We opened the first store in River Oaks, uh, supported by a store in Katy. And about four years ago, we opened the third store. That was the one in Uptown Park. I think that the biggest challenge that any business can have is the financial one. And coming from outside the US, it's even bigger because you don't have the credit scores or the credibility in front of the financial institutions to ask for money. So everything that you have to invest, you have to invest it for yourself. I think my proudest moment with Araya is when a big retailer here came to us asking us to be with them and to sell our products in their stores. It sounds very small, but that for us gave like the huge credibility in front of the audience, in front of our people. Stefano's story is inspiring because we all strive to be successful. Here to tell us about their path to success are Sonia Clayton, President and CEO of Virtual Intelligence Providers, Maria Rios, bienvenida, looking great. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> President and CEO of Nation Waste, and you're going to tell us all about your helmet and your tiara afterwards. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And then Alex Lopez Negrete, bienvenido, the President and CEO of Lopez Negrete Communication. Bienvenidos. Gracias, gracias. gracias. Thank you. Thank you. So, the three of you, something that I love is that the three of you are not only um, entrepreneurs and successful businessmen, but you are, and businesswoman, uh, but you are self-made. So my question to you is, being a Latino, has it been an advantage or a disadvantage, Sonia? I think it's been an advantage for me because um, of my upbringing. Uh, we come through, or in my case, I grew up in Latin America. I was born in Colombia. I grew up in poverty in Venezuela, and I came through a lot of adversity. And um, when I came here, I found things to be rather easy in many ways because of the number of challenges that I had to encounter. Mm -hmm. So it's been an, uh, uh, an advantage Definitely. for you. For you, Alex, I bet that... It's been an advantage, for your, sure. Your <laughs> cultural heritage plays a big part in your career. Yeah, because it is what we do, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we, we, we connect corporate America with Hispanic America, and if you're not Latino, you really don't know how to do that, right? But I also believe that as an entrepreneur, being Latino gives you a, um, a different perspective. It gives you a different way of looking at the world, a, way of diff a different way of looking at communications, and of course, creativity. So, I mean, I'm, I am Latino by, uh, by birth, and it's been a Hasta wonderful el thing. Hasta el hueso. <laughs> <laughs> Maria, and you, tell me, has it been an advantage or a disadvantage? And before that, of course, show off your tiara and your helmet because this is a lady that knows that 
trash is your treasure, right? Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for having me, and I'm so thrilled and honored just to be here. Thank you for the invitation and sharing, you know, stage with, with these phenomenal entrepreneurs. I'm Maria Rios, of course, president and CEO for Nation Waste. Nation Waste is a fully certified waste removal service provider for commercial and industrial solid waste. We provide services to small business owners, the Fortune 500 companies, and government entities. I'm the first Latina in the U.S. history owning a waste management company uh, in a male-dominated industry. How does it feel to be the only woman every time? Because I, I believe the statistics say that in the field, for example, of oil and gas, it's 0.4% yeah. of Latinas who own a business in that field. So for many Latinas, they have the experience of being the only woman in the room for 99.6% of the time. So what is it like? Well, for me, uh, it is uh, uh, a challenge. And in the beginning, it was a challenge. And of course, uh, it's also a privilege because it's a business opportunity. But many times, you know, I started thinking, well, it's a business, it's a challenge. Uh, but, you know, let's just take that, let's leverage that. Take advantage of that being the first woman in the waste industry and leverage to, it's, it's all about business. So I took advantage of that. And, and basically, it's been a, a great opportunity just to be the only Latina in the waste industry. The, not only the only, the queen. Oh. The queen. The, <laughs> we have royalty in the studio, the, and I didn't know. And, and I'm, so, I'm so, I mean, proud, you know, and, and, and I feel privileged that the uh, American and national media name me the queen of trash. So for me, <laughs> yes, a, a round of applause for the you queen know, of trash. That's a great honor. Uh, yes. I turn trash <laughs> into treasure, and I make millions hauling waste. And that, you know what? And that is a mindset because I think the three of you have had a chance and the vision to look uh, in your reality and find opportunities where other people, maybe they don't see that opportunity. Sure. So um, in your case, Sonia, how important was it to find that opportunity? Because you started, let me tell you this, this lady started her company two weeks after 9-11 when everybody was, yeah. yeah uh, with a very hard, uh, sad heart, you know, you too, of course, were with a sad heart, but you also thought about a business opportunity. Absolutely, and, and that was uh, perhaps um, a little bit of vision at that point. Um, that I had a, that particular moment, I saw the economy crash, basically. The next day after we were attacked, we just, we were down, down to the ground, and um, I took it personally. To me, it, this was a slap on the face of America. And I was just going to contribute in any way I could to rebuild America. And with that determination, I just uh, gathered my former employees. Uh, we, had, we had all lost our jobs. We were unemployed mm -hmm. and decided to create VIP. So talk about turning a crisis into an opportunity. Absolutely. It was, uh, and everybody told me it wouldn't work, right? It was. It was a bad time, and we were going down, diving down into the economy, and uh, it, it didn't look like, you know, the future didn't look too bright. But in reality, it turned out to be a diving economy, yes, but anything that comes down has to go up, and I was able to uh, foresee that. And I was able to consider that America was a very strong country. We've been through a lot as a country, and um, we always come back. The mm -hmm. resilience of this nation is, is amazing. And, and for Alex, you too saw an opportunity that was overseen by most of the people because you have to think about 1985 and knocking on doors and telling people, you know, put your money in the Latino market yeah. and put your money in the Latino advertising. So that must have been really tough. Well, uh, it really was. You know, it was after the oil bust. Uh, Houston was not necessarily in the best of shapes, but you know, not unlike your situation, I mean, Sometimes when it's not far to fall, it's a great time to rise, you know, and uh, and that's kind of what Kathy and I did. You know, my, my partner and wife, Kathy Lopez Negrete, we built the business together. I, 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 I understand the power of powerful women every day. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is harder, to have a business that runs for such a long time or a marriage that lasts for such a long time? Well, they're both <laughs> they're, they're both partnerships, you know. And when you when when you respect each other, uh, when you have each other's back, just like any partnership, uh, it, it it works. But you know, when when Kathy and I opened the agency, we 
actually opened it with a, with real estate and sports mm -hmm. as our uh, as our forte, and you know the passion was to be a Latino agency, and it was the 1980s. We already had the census under our arms, and I tell people, you know, if you really didn't couldn't foresee what the Latino community was going to do in this country in the 80s with the census, then you had the 1990 census. You know, the line was doing this. Uh, I'll tell you, if anybody's surprised that uh, the Latino community today represents $2.13 trillion of GDP, if the Latino community mm. was a standalone economy, it would generate 2.13, or does generate $2.13 trillion of GDP, which would make it bigger than India. Wow. Okay? So when you, uh, uh, America's an interesting uh, thing because when you talk business, which I'm sure you had to mm -hmm. do, you know, when you talk facts, when you really say, here's the black and white and irrefutable business case to market to 60 million Latinos, corporate America has this tendency to go, oh, I'm interested. Uh huh. And when we talk about Latinas, Latinas, Latino owned businesses are the fastest growing segment right now. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you know it, ladies, because you thrive in male dominated arenas and industries, there's a lot of gender bias that you have to face and that many Latinas have to face. And we grew up with uh, many sayings in, in our back, back in the day, saying that calladita te ves más bonita. And we know that, you know, women, uh, well-behaved women rarely make history. So how do you go to a room and stand up for what you believe in, knowing that maybe there are stereotypes in the middle of, the, of this perception when you're pitching. Well, uh, you know, I just feel that um, I'm the proof living uh, American dream. I came to America at 13 from El Salvador because of a civil war. And I finished uh, school, uh, graduated from University of Houston, and created this business plan and founded my own business in a male-dominated industry. But what I didn't know is that whenever I saw these contracts fill under Mario Rios, not Maria Rios. <laughs> <laughs> Mario is looking fabulous. Exactly, <laughs> with this thing in high heels. But you know, um, what I did at the time, you know, you need to learn how to take the BS with dignity. Mm. Sign the contract because that's what you're after. Exactly. Your, your eye on the ball. Absolutely. All the time. Keep the eye on the prize. Uh huh. Absolutely. How about you? Poison confidence. <laughs> Um, I found myself, my, my industry is technology specifically to the oil and gas industry. So I not only have to deal with technology terminology, technology principles, engineering principles of technology, but I also have to deal with everything pertaining to oil. It's male and male everywhere you look at it. Uh -huh. So what are the biggest, you have to go out there and ask for money for either Latino businesses, Latino brands, or multicultural um, uh, budget. So what is the biggest misconception that you face when you're trying to pitch these ideas or to pitch these projects uh, for the Latino community? Uh, well, for me, I'm in the waste industry. It comes so <coughs> easy. Uh, to work in and, and partner actually with large corporations in America. Mm -hmm. And so in reality, with all the certifications, like in my industry, it comes easy, hand in hand, because they have something for me, I have something for them. So in your arena, there, you don't feel like there's much of a prejudice? It's, it's pretty much the same as any other, but any, anybody else presenting a contract? Absolutely, yes. Gotcha. So it's, well, it, it depends. Many times it depends which uh, corporation you're presenting the contract to, but uh, a lot of times it's to my advantage. Alex? Well, you know, I mean, for, for, for us, it's a little bit of a double thing because first, as a Latino-owned, privately held enterprise, uh, you, you face, or at least we faced early on, was can you do the job? Do you have the resources? Do you have the expertise? Mm -hmm. Do you have the tools? You know, and you have to demonstrate that you do. I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's no shortcut. You either do the job or you don't. And when you, when you don't do the job, you probably won't get another one. So you really have to, you know, in Try over hard. 32 years, we've been able to demonstrate that we have the scale, the resources, the staying power, the obsession of detail, and all those <laughs> things. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, you know, and, and, and when, when I go in to talk to a, to a prospect, uh, and sometimes to even existing clients, 
you know, do Latinos have the buying power? Mm -hmm. Will Latinos buy this expensive car that I'm trying to market? Will Latinos do this? Will you know? Uh, will they open checking accounts? Will they? And you know, I think uh, fortunately we have a lot of research, uh, research resources to our uh, to to come available to, to be able to say, you know, yes, and let's give it a shot. You okay. know, and again, when you prove the case and the customers start uh -huh. buying those cars or trucks, you know, then, oh, you then know. it works. Now I want to finish. I know Sonia, we're here. Yes. So I want to finish with Sonia's quote that says, "It's not fate or culture that will define me. It's me." and my own power. And I think the three of you are a true example that this can be accomplished. So thank you very much. Now let's check in. Now let's check in with our digital studio, Aurora. What are you hearing from folks? Thanks, Gabby. People are already asking questions about small businesses, personal finance, and we have two experts here with us in the studio. One of them is David Carvajal, financial advisor, who will be answering all of your questions on uh, Twitter or Facebook Live. And the other one here with us today is Liz Lara Carreño. She is a small business expert from Houston Community College. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, Liz. Thank you for having me. Liz, we have a couple of questions already coming in. Uh, our guests are really inspirational, apparently. Mm -hmm. One of them is, are Latinos in disadvantage when opening a new business and why? Uh, actually, no. I think actually it's an advantage. Uh, you have three examples right there at the table with us today. Maria Rios came here, started her business from scratch. You have Sonia Clayton, who left corporate, started her business. Uh, and then you have Lopez de Greta, who's a leader in his industry. You know, it's really part of a mindset. Business is business. And so it's important for you to uh, create your business plan, know your business or your service. And really, that's where it begins. If you've got a great idea, uh, that's where it begins. We have one of words asking a question for the panel, but we have our expert here to answer it. What's your number one piece of advice for the next generation of Latino entrepreneurs? What is your advice, Liz? I would probably say, aside from doing the research, setting up your business plan, uh, and really understanding that there is a need or a want for your product in the market, I mean, you look for those gaps, uh, but be prepared to fail. And from that, don't become a victim, be a good student and use that. And there is nothing wrong in failing. And I know that, uh, 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 Alex put up, you know, if you don't if you don't fall far, then it's easier to rise. But you know, business is business, and those are the cliff jumpers. Uh, they come here with an idea, uh, they're hungry for it, and they provide the products and the services. I mean, that's how many of the communities were built here in Houston. Uh, this is a very entrepreneurial city with a lot of resources to help anyone. And I think that we need to look at Latino businesses. Um, we are the norm. We are not a phenomenon. Uh, and so we really need to remove any of those obstacles or thought processes that we might have with that. Uh, but you can go to any community and we just don't service Latino communities. We have products and services for everyone in the city. So I'll, along those lines, Liz, the last question very quickly, what's the first thing that I need to do to start a business? Very quickly. Uh, I would probably say that uh, do your research, understand if it's an idea or something that's actually implementable. Use the resources. Here in Houston, uh, you have SBA.gov. It's done in English and in Spanish. City of Houston, Office of Business Opportunity, English and Spanish. Houston Community College, San Jacinto College. There are resources and they're in multiple languages it's, and they're free. So don't pay anyone yet. Look for those free services because there's a lot of people willing to help. Okay, thank you very much, Liz, for your advice. Please keep your comments coming and your questions as well. Remember, hashtag tu voz es poder. Your voice is power. Back to you, Gabby. Thanks, Aurora. Houston cultural scene is thriving, and that is in large part due to the involvement from the city's huge Latino community. To tell us more about it, I'm joined by Jessica Halsey, community activist from Houston's East End, Maria Inés Sicardi, founder of the Sicardi Gallery in Montrose, and David Cordua, executive chef of Cordua Restaurants. Thank you very much for joining us today. So, I love talking about arts, I love talking about culture, because there's something new every time that surprises us. So, what is fascinating you at this moment, the things that you see? It could be an artist, it could be a new place, 
David, what is, fa what is the most fascinating thing you've seen lately here in the, in, the, in the art scene? Well, I think just like we were talking about earlier, Houston being the city of the future, a lot of the culture is, is like that in its, in its diversity. Um, so the, the, the food scene obviously is, is phenomenal and it's finally being recognized uh, nationwide for, for how great it is. As far as the arts, you have, you know, on the, on the east end, some incredible oh. things happening that uh, are, f are finally getting national attention as well. And then also uncovering um, and celebrating the city's history. One of my favorite things is the <coughs> cisterns on Buffalo Bayou, something that was, you know, just exposed and, and discovered and taken over by the Museum of Fine Arts that you'll only find in Houston and in Istanbul of all places. It's absolutely gorgeous. So it's an exciting time to be, to be in Houston. Mm -hmm. Maria Inés, you've been promoting arts for decades now. Uh, so what have you seen lately that has been fascinating? Talking about the cistern, the, recently the artist Mar este Magdalena Fernandez is an artist that I represent. Oh, well. And was showing this uh, uh, fantastic uh, installation of 26 projections of the rain. I don't know if you have seen it or not, but um, I've been, uh, you know, very involved with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, with the institution's Photo Fest, and I think that uh, Houston, when I have moved to Houston in 1989, mm. was not anything really like of now. Latin American art. And uh, today you have a fantastic collection at the Museum of Fine Arts yes. of Latin American yes. art. We have a fantastic exhibition that opened right a month ago mm -hmm. of Mexican art. Uh, three months ago, a Cuban exhibition that was amazing. And the interest of the public is there, which is yes, the you most know, the important thing. The exhibition was full of people and was a big celebration. And uh, it's something that has been, you know, we have been building. I've been part of that process also, and uh, it's fascinating just to see that it's happening, mm -hmm. and we have more to do, mm -hmm. you know. And Jessica, what about you? Well, um, very happy to say that not only at the Houston uh, Museum of Fine Arts, but it's coming to our East End, to our neighborhood, you know. That art, that fine art is coming to my neighborhood. Mm. We have a, a, a very active, um, art group, um, a center, call it TBH. And it's coming to TBH, it's coming to the people. This is coming to us. They're bringing all this good art uh, to us. And you know, uh, the same thing, you, it, it, Eastern is thriving. Mm -hmm. As far as art, it's, it's happening, it's happening. You see it everywhere, uh, murals, murals, mm -hmm. uh, murals on uh, uh, city boxes, you know, so it's wonderful. I am very excited and very welcoming that it's happening now. So yes. you talk to different people and you're an activist, so what are the challenges that an artist face here in Houston? Because to be financially independent is very hard on itself for an artist, so what does, it, what does Houston have as a challenge for this type of uh, professions? Well, uh, you know, um, challenges uh, so maybe, but uh, thank God that Houston is, it's, it's a given city. We what all have an opportunity if you want to mm -hmm. achieve what you really want, you will find a art center that we have one. Mm -hmm. We have more than one. Uh, so all you need to do is want it to achieve what you want. Mm -hmm. And you will find it here in Houston. And yes. David, for you, in your perspective as a restaurateur, uh, what are the challenges? Well, I think the challenges as a newcomer to the city, especially if you're an ethnic cuisine, is, uh, is, getting, is getting involved and being part of the chef, a chef community. And there's it's a lot a of opportunities. It's a very competitive arena. It's competitive, but it's also very collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of that uh, we started about 10 years was the Houston Culinary Tours. We'll actually load a bus with about 30 people and get a cooler of St. Arnold's beer and just start restaurant hopping you know, in different neighborhoods. We'll tackle the East End yes. one time, we'll tackle, tackle Chinatown, Long Point. Um, so that, that's one of the challenges of getting new, new chefs involved is, is being part of this very collaborative uh, community of chefs. 
And Marines, what are the challenges that you find when you're trying to promote art here in Houston? What would you like for it to, to happen? I, uh, <laughs> Is there I, any particular dif difficulty that you're facing uh, or that you have faced in the past? That I had faced, yes, of course. I was from Argentina. I didn't know anybody in Houston. And I started the gallery five years later with one client. <laughs> but I built slowly a clientele and a you know, great group of artists. I met wonderful people in Houston. It's a city that is very, very welcoming. If you have a project, you can do it, like you said. Mm -hmm. yes, and uh, there are great patrons, you know, people that support the arts, the arts. The, all the institutions, nonprofits. And I think that uh, I have seen how it's possible to do something in this city. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things when I interview up and coming artists, one of the things that they mention or complain about the most is that they have the chicken and the egg type of problem. They don't get the opportunities that will give them a lot of exposures because they don't have enough fan base and they don't have enough fan base because they still haven't reached a, a moment where they can have those opportunities. So for somebody who wants to break that cycle, for somebody who wants to stand out and is an artist, what would be your advice? They really need to work very hard. They need to, at some times, they need to have a real a career they need to be professional artists. They need to maybe teach in a university or in a school and then help themselves to really get where they want. So don't it's ask your art to pay the bills from day one. It's, <laughs> it's very difficult. It's almost impossible. You know, I've been in this business for 23 years and there are very few artists in percentage that really can have a decent life just painting. You know, the market have changed so much. We need more galleries. We need more collectors, especially. Mm -hmm. Do you see any commonalities on the artists that are really successful? Is there something that you see in all of them that people who are up and coming can learn from? There are a lot of, you know, sometimes it's luck. It's where you are in the right moment or in the wrong, you know, it's, it's really. But the most important is to work really hard. You know, it's not something that you can do in the side or two hours a day. You really need to mm -hmm. work and try to show your work, of course. Uh -huh. What would be your advice? Well, uh, you know, it's more than art happening in the East End. East End is really, everything is happening and everything is good, isn't it? Absolutely. Would you agree with me? <laughs> yes. It's going to be a town in like three, four oh, years. Oh, I'm telling you, I mean, you know, <laughs> especially on Harrisburg, Harrisburg, mm -hmm. uh, Navigation, uh, and now with the new uh, Complete Communities Initiative that the mayor has presented to us, uh, that's wonderful. That's what we were waiting for. Uh, areas like mine, uh, Second Ward, uh, you know, Third Ward, that's a blessing now that this uh, community, complete community uh, initiative is coming to us. We need to take advantage and everybody is going to be included on that complete communities initiative. Everything. That will be the perfect time for you, for you and I to ask everything, you know, because with that initiative, uh, a lot of things that we can make happen. Mm -hmm. So East End is doing very well and is very well desired. Everybody wants to come and, <laughs> and move to the <laughs> East End, you know? So. Do you have some connections that we could? Oh, yeah. definitely. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> I, I know people. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, so. I think one of the challenges in Houston is that uh, because we're unzoned, and like, uh, unlike a lot of other cities, there's no, there's no, no main sorry. street, there's no one obvious place that everyone gravitates to probably other than the gallery. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, it, it needs to be curated, like an art, an art gallery with, with restaurants, with, with street we art, need, these, need these cultural uh, focus centers that, that bring people together. Um, Please come to Harrisburg. Please yeah. come to us. Yeah. Yeah. We need you. <laughs> <laughs> we need but, you there. But for example, in your line of work, in your industry, how can somebody stand out? There's so many people opening restaurants. So many people open restaurants yeah. that if you go ask for a loan, you know that your interest rate is higher because of the failure rate that is so high. Everybody wants to open a and restaurant. That's never going to change. But it, it is very competitive. One way to stand out, and you're saying it's a very generous city, 
um, yes, is, right. is for uh, businesses and especially restaurants to get involved in, in, some, in some form of nonprofit because that always gets people's attention and there's no, there's no shortage of, of opportunities to That's give. Right. That's right. Would you say that it, maybe somebody who wants to make their mark in uh, the, the food industry or the restaurant industry, they should try um, something that is very ethnic, something that is out of the box, something that is, well, you don't want to give away your secrets, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's, the, that's the beautiful of the thing about the food landscape in Houston is that it's so open to absolutely everything. everything my, my family uh, came from Nicaragua during the Nicaraguan Revolution, and the only thing known here was Mexican as far as Latin American cuisine. And I, th I think our success is really a, a testament to the city of Houston mm -hmm. and how welcoming and inviting and open-minded the people here are. Well, last thing, I know there's people watching us uh, via uh, online and Facebook, so just very briefly, pitch us Houston. Why should people come if they don't live here? Why should they come and experience the city? Houston is a very friendly city. It's a welcoming city. It's an embracing city. Houston embraces people. We want everybody to come to Houston because uh, Houston is so uh, giving. Mm -hmm. We need to be more appreciative to the city, okay. city of Houston because he, they're very good. Will you agree with me? No. Yeah, and I have only 40 seconds, so 20 seconds. Why should people come to Houston? <laughs> Come to Houston, and if you don't, Houston's going to come to you. Ah. <laughs> the, the country's going to look like this yes. in the future. Marines? I love Houston. Houston is the people. I always say that when I am out of town. And I think that need, uh, Houston needs to be better promoted outside. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And everybody's buying a ticket to Houston right now. Okay. <laughs> we are getting commissions. Okay. So let's check one last time with our digital studio. Aurora, what are you hearing from folks? Hi, Gabby. We are here getting comments and questions as well about the arts and culture and the Latino influence in Houston's cultural um, universe. And here with us today, again, is Liz Lara Carreño. She's not just a financial advisor, small business advisor, but also Liz has been a member of the board of Arte Publico Press and Ali Theater, among others. She's the perfect example of a Latina who is involved with a cultural universe in Houston. Liz, how are you? Thank I'm you again. Good. <laughs> so we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, the first one is, why don't we have more support for Latino cultural expressions? Uh, I think that you really need to first take a look at our participation. Uh, we have the Houston Arts Alliance, we have the Museum of Fine Arts, you have the Alley Theater, Jones Hall. Uh, I will tell you that when I sat on uh, those boards and I worked with them on a number of committees, uh, there weren't that many Latinos on there. And I think for us to integrate ourselves uh, as business owners, I always tell my business owners, put aside a certain percentage, budget yourself, uh, and that's what you use to support your community, uh, support the arts, support the music, uh, go into your community and schools. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that the Museum of Fine Arts had the showing that they did, uh, but for that, we need to expand it. And I think that uh, Houston having the largest population of Latinos uh, in Texas that by now we should probably have our own theater. You know, I grew up down the street from Teatro Bilingue, um, and so I'm very familiar with that neighborhood, and you know, that we need to support that with funds and with support uh, and with the scope of what we want to bring in. Uh, Liz, along those lines, very quickly, someone is asking us, do Latino artists in town have enough help to develop their projects? Um, I mentioned the Houston Arts Alliance, and there are grants, and I think that uh, I, I'm finding out that maybe it's the resources that people are not aware of that are available here throughout Houston. Uh, and there are numerous grants, but, you know, learning and working with many of the schools, and I don't just think about art artists. Uh, it is also about musicians. Uh, I also think food is an art. Uh, you know, think of the number of chefs that are actually throughout Texas. Actually, I want to know why there's not more chefs on the Food Network channel. Come on. Uh, so I think that for us, it is the community itself investing in those organizations that exist here in the city and also coming together, like behind Teatro Bilingue, uh, and writing those checks because that's what it's going to take to support those communities. 
everybody comes from a different part, South America, uh, Mexico, Spain. We want all of those to be displayed here and we want to enjoy them. But that takes money and that takes time and support from the community. Uh, and as business owners, we need a budget for that. And as people who enjoy it, we need to write our small checks, whether it's $5 or $5,000, doesn't matter. Okay, um, thank you very much, okay. Liz, for your answer. And thank you very much at home for your participation. Your comments and your questions have been crucial for us tonight. This, as I said, is your town hall as well. But remember, it's not over. You can still send your comments and questions to us using the hashtag Tu Voz Es Poder, Your Voice Is Power. Keep the conversation on. Gaby Osvaldo. Gracias, Aurora. And something that we have not mentioned, Osvaldo, mm -hmm. is that we are making history because this is the first time that Houston Public Media is hosting a Latino town hall. So that deserves a big round yeah. of applause. Once again, Houston is doing something for the first time ever. Uh -huh. So this has been my home for the past 22 years. So my heart is split in half. Half belongs to Houston, half belongs to Ovalle, Chile. Uh -huh. but, but, you know, this is my home right now. I'm very proud of Houston. Uh, and after, you know, hosting these shows and listening to the audience and everybody, I'm more proud to be a Houstonian. Ex exactly. And we have proved something that is really important today, that Chile and Argentina <laughs> can get along. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Especially, especially if we don't discuss soccer, right? Exactly. <laughs> Nor wine. <laughs> or but, wine. But actually, right now, we also have uh, people from the audience, and one of them is, is Rose. Rose, we hear your story at the beginning. So what are your thoughts after uh, the whole show? Uh, to be honest, when I hear the neg negativity that people say, it's kind of hurtful. But at the same time, you see a big group of people like Fiel and other different communities that are pulling in and, you know, luchando. We're not going to give up. We're going to have some type of reform, and that's the, that's the victory. That's what we're looking for. Have you changed a little bit after what, what you hear, or has your plans changed? No, not at all. I'm going to keep on fighting. Perfect. Thank you. We have a member of our audience, Tony. Tony, this you witnessed history in the making today. What has been your biggest takeaway? I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. <laughs> and this is like, this is intellectual, entertaining, inspiring. This is what TV should be like. So les felicito. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you to PBS, uh, to Houston Public Media, to Univision, who, was a, who is a partner. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think it has been a true honor to be a part of it. So, Osvaldo, muchísimas exactly. gracias también. No, thanks to you. Gracias, Gaby. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Actually, once again, uh, I'm going to second you on saying that this is how television uh, should be because uh, I think that lately we're getting kind of like tired of uh, all these fake reality shows. This is reality. What you yeah. saw today, <laughs> this, believe me, this is a reality show. May, you may not find it entertaining, but it's a reality show. This is what you need to be watching if you really want to improve your life. Thanks for watching at home tonight and chiming in our social media. And of course, the conversation is not over. You can keep the dialogue going on social media with that hashtag. Remember, your voice is power or tu voz es poder. Thank you so much for joining us and good night. Good night. This program is sponsored by San Jacinto College. Your goals, your college.